So I've been in the news recently because over at Nantech we published a review of this. The 11700K, uh, Intel's currently unreleased 8-core desktop CPU. Um, long review over at Nantech, suggest you go read. Uh, but the kind folks at Harder Unboxed uh, had a review of my review. So I'm going to review their review of my review. What's your minimum specification? So let's listen in to see what these guys have to say. Earlier today, Anantec posted a review of the Core i7 11700K, Intel's new Rocket Lake processor. This one. And, well, we're still under NDA, but we can talk about this. So we've brought Steve in and we're going to have a little bit of a discussion. So let's get to it. Welcome back to Hardware Unbox uh, to talk a little bit about what has been going on with the new Core i7 11700K review that we've seen from Anantec that was posted just a couple of hours ago before I think we went live just three or four hours ago. So NDAs never apply when you can buy the product. That's true. NDAs don't apply. Typical NDA language will say um, everything that you learn or do with what we tell you is under NDA unless you find it from a separate source. Now, purchasing a CPU at retail and testing it, that's a different source. So we're in a very unique situation with this Anantec review where they have gone and bought a Core i7-11700K. Sorry if I'm not looking directly at the camera because I've got the article that we're going to be looking at over here as well. But And because this is a retail review, we can talk about their review, which is a very interesting situation. It's kind of, we can't talk about any of the performance data that we may or may not have. We can't talk about any of the news that we may or may not be under NDA about. So we have to be pretty careful what we say here. This is why I'm reviewing the review of the review. Um, but I think it'll be interesting to go through and analyze some of this stuff. But first of all, I just want to ask you, Steve, what do you think about publishing this sort of review like this? Is this, this is going to be interesting because... I mean, I've got strong opinions about you know, breaking NDAs, and as, as we discussed, this is not under NDA. So interesting to hear what other press think about it. This, are you fine with this? Yeah, I don't really have a problem with it. It's fair play to Anantec. They got a sample well ahead of time. It's not, like, it's not like they've undercut other reviewers by a few days, which I think would be a, seen as being a little bit dirty. But because it's so far in advance, I don't see that as being too much of an issue. Yeah, I mean, if I was in the situation there in where I had the sample now and it wasn't under NDA, I think I'd go ahead and release our review as well. So um, so Linus said the same thing. <laughs> if, you're, if you're able to buy a retail CPU before a launch, it's fair game. And uh, that's what we did. Yeah, fair play to Anantec. Don't have any problem with what they've done here. It's not something you really do see from... Uh, say an AMD or in particular Nvidia certainly I'd disagree a bit here because it could happen with any sort of retailer um, distributor local distributor you know onto sales so um, I mean Intel is obviously the name we have right now um, because it's just happened um, but I can see other companies falling foul of this you know regardless of the name it depends on how the companies are sampling their partners usually, how many sort of leaks we get and what have you, um, because partners will share the CPUs, um, uh, Intel or AMD will share partners with the CPUs, and sometimes they'll keep them under very strict lock and key. Other times there'll be, you know, hundreds or thousands in the uh, in the review space, in, in, in the OEM space. So it depends on it really also depends on how valued the launch is and how strict they want to be i mean i've i've seen launches where um a company like amd or intel will send cpu to a motherboard manufacturer and they will only give that motherboard manufacturer like four units for the whole company and those units can only say stay in a very specific room they have to be signed in and signed out and once a week if not more there'll be an audit to make sure that all the CPUs are still there at the company. Um, and in other launches, yeah, stuff isn't tracked, so. And this is obviously pretty bad. It's a three and a half weeks before you're actually meant to be able to buy one. Uh, so back in the day, Sandy Bridge 2010-2011, um, Anant of Anantech, he actually published a full review of Sandy Bridge in August 2010, 
and the product wasn't actually it wasn't launched until January 2011. So that's what a five month lead on that review. These things used to happen a lot more than they do now, um, and in uh, I'd argue in a lot shadier circumstances perhaps back then. Still, you know, making sure that NDAs um, aren't broken, or at least the, the ones from the pu- from the press perspective aren't broken. Obviously, somebody up in the chain has broken theirs, but. Again, it's it's all on Intel. Well, it's not even That's on right. them. I, I guess it's on them from a perspective that they should have maybe not allowed these into the retail channel so early because if a retailer's got it now and the sales embargo is at the end of March, that's quite a long time. There were there were a number of um, suggested leaks. Nothing that we can confirm that the launch day was going to be earlier. So that might be why retailers have units today ready to sell. And Intel's just pushed back everything. Um, so that is one reason why these re- retailers would have units early. But it's also on that particular retailer and the retailers that have been selling these products. And I imagine there'll be very significant repercussions for this. Very, very significant from Intel. Mm. You have to think, if even if a re- say Amazon accidentally sold CPUs earlier or, or you know, dispatched them earlier than intended... Intel's not going to cut out Amazon. Um, it's just because it's such a large volume of you know potential revenue. It would it depends on the size of the retailer and the the market that they're in. Uh, so it's um, if you're if you're a small time retailer, obviously they're going to cut you off. You know if you're dealing in sort of like tens of units a week, but if you're dealing in hundreds or potentially thousands of units a week, I mean across the whole spectrum of CPUs, then yeah, they're not going to cut you off. Basically, it has yeah. happened. Intel shouldn't have allowed it to happen, and they'll have to make steps in the future to make sure this stuff doesn't happen again, I suppose. Yeah, they do need to get their leaks under control because it feels like the past couple of launches we've seen leaked benchmarks for weeks and weeks. I don't really pay much attention to the leaked benchmarks because they're leaks, um, because they're usually single-sourced, uh, because I've been around so for so long that I've seen so many leaks faked. It's just no point in dealing with that sort of stuff unless it's from a very reputable source uh, it, or it's double sourced, triple sourced, um, or somebody can demonstrate that, you know, they had, they're the ones that are the source of whatever's being leaked. Coming up to the release, it's not, not usual to get a retail sample like this. Usually yeah. it comes through... Yeah you know, your partners and that sort of thing who send it out to people they shouldn't be early or their system integrated. Oh, no, they always send it out to people that they want to send it out to. They're talking about a 200 megahertz difference uh, from 4.6 gigahertz to 4.8 gigahertz for the all core. So for the 11700K numbers, I should point out that all these numbers were gleaned from um, the internal firmware. Uh, tools that we can use to just look at the cpu these were all numbers that you know are confirmed inside inside the processor so yep negligible difference there i mean that's the kind of difference we usually see when you go from like you know a a, a core i7 part to the, the next one down on the stack uh, but as ian suggests in this article there are multiple reasons for why there isn't a 10 core part the dies being much bigger so there's power consumption uh, concerns there. Obviously, you'd have to clock the cores lower, which then you get this really weird situation where in, say, the Core i9 11900K was a 10-core 20-thread part. In a lot of workloads, it would end up being slower than the Core i7 part, and then that would just be... It'd look bad in graphs. It'd be a whole mess confusing when it makes sense to buy the 10-core part. Mm, I, I might disagree here because... Um... Okay, you add a couple of cores, uh, so the uh, power limits get spread out over those cores, but you're actually driving the core to a more efficient point, so you get better performance per watt. So for the workloads that can take advantage of more cores, you would actually get better performance. And then you might have the opportunity, if the binning is right, to make the single core at least equivalent, if not better. Uh, Though that does put extra pressure on die size cost binning ultimately intel's made cpus bigger than say four or five hundred square millimeters before um 
and we believe this eight core rocket lake is around 270 to 290 so if if they made it 10 core and made it 330 that's still by far not the biggest cpu intel has ever made um biggest eight core biggest 10 core sure when it doesn't really you want the core i9 to be ahead of the core i7 for every workload whether it's all core single core the whole lot Let's talk about but the power I, consumption. I was going to say, let's, we let's probably... get into that first. This is the first <laughs> yeah. page of the Anantec review. Again, I'm not going to show all parts of the review because that would obviously be unfair on Anantec. You should go read their article if you want to see all the individual. <laughs> Thanks, Underworld Hardware Unbox. Yeah, no, this is this is they're doing a really good fair use here. So uh, bits and pieces, all the individual benchmarks and all that. But there are some interesting things that I want to just point out and talk about maybe a couple of graphs here and there. I think the first one is probably this peak power chart uh, that's been sh seen at the bottom of the second page and also in the conclusion, which sort of compares 11... So a uh, site confession here, initially the first version of this chart didn't have the AVX2 number. Um, that's because in the past when we've had CPUs with AVX512, we haven't differentiated. But in this case, um, after seeing some of the initial comments on power consumption, we decided to add in you know, the AVX2 number. Um, and as you can tell, it's, it's 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 about where it should be, for for what it is. Um, it's just that the AVX five twelve number is uh, is a lot higher than what people expected. Eleven seven hundred K in a, it's got AVX two AVX five twelve there, and it's got some comparisons to ten seven hundred K fifty eight hundred X and so on. And mm -hmm. it's a power hungry part. It, there's there's no doubt about it looking at that chart that according to their data, it's Th nearly 300 watts using AVX 512 for this sort of part is crazy. Definitely. Well so, I mean, a lot of people criticize using peak power because peak could be sort of like the instantaneous peak before it comes down. Um, these numbers are pretty consistent um, across a lot of a lot of workload. Um, it's 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 not as you know instantaneous milliseconds as perhaps some people suggest. Um, these 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 powers can be sustained. It's um, and you know for some of the AMD stuff that's actually you know hitting the socket limit. But with the Intel stuff, um, discussed turbo quite a lot um, and intricacies of turbo. I won't go into that here. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 the way this platform is gonna gonna look from now on. It looks like. Well, I. I mean, yes, yes, for the AVX five twelve stuff. The AVX two is probably what I'd focus on more because at least with that you can make some direct comparisons to the ten seven hundred K and the fifty eight hundred X as well. Quite clear what workload that is in. Like these numbers are a bit different to what we've published comparing those two CPUs, but we use a Blender. So, um, so the numbers we use for these graphs, it's uh, it's an average over all the benchmarks we run the power test over um 90 95 percent of the time it's something like a poivre workload um though we also have um an ai workload in there that's uh, avx2 accelerated um there's also a uh, lin pack which is avx2 um and yeah it's, it's just just things like that whereas the avx512 workload is specifically um our 3d particle movement benchmark um, because that is more consistent than the Y Cruncher power load, which also uses AVX five twelve. Yeah, this yeah, might be I'm like sure. this might be like peak of all the AVX two workloads yeah. that were being run, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and we report the average power consumption throughout the duration of the benchmark. So it's it's you get different numbers. Practical that is because what did they say? The CPU was hitting within seconds. It was hitting ninety degrees and then going up to a hundred, hundred and four degrees as the peak temperature. Yeah, uh, and what they were using quite a substantial cooler, if I recall correctly. Uh, it's a cooler that I reviewed and tested a very, very long time ago. I don't. It's an old cooler. No, if this is an updated version, having a look at the product page, I don't think so because it's made by Thermal Right. Uh, it is a massive copper air cooler, huge copper heat sink. It weighs almost it's it's one point nine kilograms, so almost two kilograms. Absolutely yep. huge air cooler. Certainly one of the best you can get uh, for air cooling performance. So that is what they're strapping onto the 11700K uh, and the other Intel processors. 
So Yeah, and I think they mentioned they have plenty of thermal headroom when they were talking about these things like that cooler has serious cooling capacity. I, I think, well, they don't have thermal headroom in the sense that it was hitting 100 degrees. I think what they're saying is the heat sink isn't being saturated with yeah, heat that's where right. it can't deal yep. with it. A sort of a deeper investigation into how much power and thermals you're looking at when gaming will be worth adding to our review. So that's probably something we'll do. In fact, I'm certain that's something we'll do. Yep. That's one of the dangers of publishing a, a, a review like this early. Uh, everybody else gets ideas about what they should test, especially if they've got the, the hardware already in. Uh, but yeah, basically for your AVX accelerated type workloads, uh, sort of the stuff we look at, yeah, the power consumption looks pretty extreme. And again, I guess, would you say AVX 512 still pretty niche for especially desktop usage? Yeah, I mean, if we look at one of the benchmarks, for example like the performance benchmarks, Anantec does have one here from an AVX 512 workload where this is clearly an ad advantage of the 11th gen part just going on this review. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, it destroys the non-AVX 512 parts. So being a desktop part in this sort of mainstream market that offers AVX 512 is good if you need it as a niche workload. But at the same time, you can see this using 290 watts of power. It's or peak power and Clearly, this is still a niche application because uh, AVX 512 has been available, I think, in server applications for a little while now, maybe one or two uh -huh. generations. Uh, Xeon Phi has been out since 2013, um, and they were the first AVX 512. That was originally where AVX 512 was going to go. And it's, it still is only adopted in a couple of things. So, yes, I guess from one perspective, you could say this is an advantage for this part, but... I should know that their AVX 512 benchmark is also a synthetic test. So yes. I believe. Sorry, correct you here. It's not synthetic. Um, it's actually code derived from my PhD work. It's to do with um, randomized 3D movement without collision. Um, in this case, the benchmark was uh, accelerated. So I wrote it natively and very naively. Um, and then it was accelerated by um, one of the AVX 512 gurus at Intel. Um, this was uh, 2017 now. Um, he, he accelerated, he no longer works at Intel anymore. He accelerated for AVX 2 and for AVX 512. AMD has the code as well. Um, so they can see all the updates that he's made to it and they haven't, they've had the code for, for, for a while now as well, but they haven't uh, suggested any updates to the code. So, um, that's where we stand on that, but it is it is a real world workload. This is this is uh, code that I used in my PhD, just a lot more performant because um, programming for AVX five twelve, it's still niche. It's very niche. I mean, um, Intel's goal here with the AVX five twelve stuff is to help accelerate casual AI, uh, being able to do the sort of um, you know inferency type workloads on the CPU that would normally be sent to the cloud. Um, so you can argue how useful that is. With the 11700K, they are looking at like a 500% performance uplift. Yep. So the fact that it uses a lot more power and stuff, it's like, well, it is 500% yeah, it's, faster. it's definitely so. more efficient, for sure. So, so some people point out that 500% uh, uplift isn't normal with AVX 512 uh, compared to AVX 2. That's because the nature of the code is that there are some, some commands in there. I think it's um, typecasting that can't be accelerated by AVX2, but can be accelerated by AVX512. And because that they're in the random number generator as well, um, that creates dependency chains, which um, make it limited in AVX2 mode versus AVX512. So this is very idealized. It does depend on your code base. Um, I mean, there's no extra overhead for startup because there is relatively no startup with a randomized particle movement. But I mean, uh, yeah, 5x is perhaps abnormal for AVX 512, but it's an example of a real-world code where it has accelerated it. So, Just some of the stuff that you might be familiar with. They've got a whole bunch of office science simulation stuff, but I think the stuff that we would normally be talking about is sort of more your rendering workloads, uh, things like Blender, things like Corona that we've tested with. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see that the... Let's take Blender, for example. The 11700K is shown here as being very slightly faster than 5800X. Um, again, sort of, it does have a performance lead on the 10700K, which you would expect given that we are seeing IPC improvements. 
um, on the same core count part. And you, this table is quite nice in that it only has the A core parts, so we're getting quite a... That was done by design. A nice little core for core comparison here. Considering I don't... You'd say, for example, I don't think Intel is trying to compete with like a 5900X or 5950X with these sort of parts. Um, I don't think 8 well, cores is going to be sufficient for those sort of things. One. Yeah, I believe what Anantec paid was between the price of a 5800X and a 5900X for the 11700K that they bought. Whether or not that's because of an early sample yeah, or not, was we, a, we don't know. Uh, definitely <laughs> a, a retailer trying to cash in and, and bump up the price. To uh, I'm pretty sure that was the situation there. So yeah. So it's uh, $469 and then import tax to the UK. Um, so add another 20% uh, plus the fees from the courier to import something. So I would consider that more of a scalper price what they paid. That really the minimum performance expectation for these parts is 5800X level. It really has to be around that. Would you agree with that? Again, depends on price, but you would hope so that that would be the step they've made. It looks at the moment, based on this, that that's kind of a best case scenario. Yeah, it really the does. Zen 3 part. Don't, don't forget this core is a backported ice lake, and some of the so there's some inefficiencies with that backporting. Um, so we're not even comparing, you know, Zen 3 to Tiger Lake. This is against ice. Uh, because if we go like right down i think down the bottom again we don't really want to show all the benchmarks but again we will have the link to their article in the video description and they go into a lot more depth than we do with our cpu uh, coverage i'd say ian is the gold standard for cpu reviews so it is definitely worth clicking the link in the video description jumping over and reading the whole thing yep. especially because you've got to wait three and a half weeks before you get any benchmarks <laughs> from us so you've got plenty of time to do it so definitely check that out but if we jump over to the, or jump down rather, to the Cinebench R20 results, you see that single thread performance is still well behind the 5800X, which is, I, I find quite surprising. Um, yeah. Again, it's 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 a backported Ice Lake. Um, remember how Ice Lake was. Um, and then if you add in some inefficiencies with the backporting process, so you're not going to get identical. Uh, yeah, it's not Tiger Lake. That's that, I mean that's the point I'm trying to get at here. So it's uh, I have seen some numbers here of of our single threaded, um, you know, kind of nearer the sort of five five ninety five ninety five mark. We got five seventy seven. That was um, we test it uh, constantly for like uh, for ten minutes, uh, then take the average of the results minus any outliers. So yeah, same. Very surprising. So yeah. There are some BIOS updates coming in. So Anantec didn't mention the Z590 board they used for testing, uh, just to protect the manufacturer or whatever. They didn't want to involve them in any blowback from Intel, uh, even though Intel said they don't care to comment on this and there's nothing they can really do about it. The damage is already done. But there are some BIOS updates coming that will improve performance in some areas by what I believe are fairly insignificant margins. So. Yep. Between now and when we do our review, we're talking about maybe a percent or two improvement in some areas. So, so I mean, it's I reached out to motherboard manufacturer and I said, you know, can I have the latest BIOS? And he said, this is, this is what we've got. Um, this has all the latest updates uh, to date that we've put in. Um, we don't know when the next update is coming. So there you go. And as, as always with reviews, there are always a point in time reviews. Um, if there's a BIOS update later that does significantly change the results, we don't think there will be, um, then yeah, we'll retest again because that's all reviews are, points in time. Um, when Anand reviewed his five Sandy Bridge five months early before launch, it was just a point in time for the state of the ecosystem then. So any review is like this, GPU, uh, CPU, SSD, with SSDs changing now, yeah, they're always reviews in points in time. Um, it's like we wouldn't go back now and retest, say, Broadwell every other year because of BIOS updates, uh, because it's fairly well matured. New With a new CPU launch, with a new platform, say, uh, when AM4 first launched, um, yeah, there was six months of good you know, BIOS updates actually helped performance there. So this is new architecture. Admittedly, you know, it's it's a, it's an isolated derivative. Um, but yes, there will be some small updates, 
um, probably around affecting how turbo response goes or motherboard manufacturers changing how their turbo policy applies. Um, but direct raw changes from Intel. Um, recently, uh, there's an Ice Lake bug that's been fixed, which reduces performance. And uh, we need to double check to see if it's actually in Rocket Lake, um, which in itself might reduce performance if it's not already in there. Um, so uh, we'll see what happens. BIOS updates, by and large, you know, for uh, a system like this, we we don't expect much change. So these results yeah. really are as, as good as it's going to get. I think it's important there to note as well that from what we're hearing from partners, these chips have been in the hands of motherboard partners for some time now. So it's not. It doesn't sound like this is a situation where Ian has bought this CPU and is using it with like a day or two day old BIOS. So, so yes, it could be true that I'm using a day or two day old BIOS, but that BIOS has been built up over months. Um, so I, I, that's the point he's trying to get at, obviously. Uh, on the motherboard no, manufacturers, well, these boards have been available for a while. The BIOSes are yeah. certainly well, they've had some time. Yeah, we, we know what a lot of these results should look like. Uh, and so there's no real surprises here. So the fact that the 11700K in the Nantex numbers, and they've even noted down the bottom here that their mobile testing has shown a score of 593 for Tiger Lake. Um, the fact that this 11700K is below that, um, it's not a particularly great result, I wouldn't have said, given that they spent all that time backporting this part or backporting a similar core architecture. It's not the exact same as Tiger Lake, but it's similar, to not be able to match their mobile parts I don't know whether the backporting would have been... It, that's the result they would have wanted from the backporting process. It's, I'd argue that because it's a different market, it doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, we used to, you know, Intel laptop chips, mobile chips, being equivalent or slightly worse than a desktop. So the fact that this is a reversal, yes, that's a change in the way of thinking, but I don't think it's that big of a deal, especially as they are relatively close. Yeah, I guess that's key to note that you possibly, well, you obviously lose some optimization in yeah. the backport process. So uh, the larger chip, for example, already know that increases things like latency. So there are some disadvantages there that, that do hurt performance. I think the key thing to note with the application benchmarks, though, I'm just quickly scrolling through to make sure this is an accurate statement. It seems like for the most part, we are looking at a performance uplift in some That's instances right. quite a substantial one but as far as productivity general applications general desktop pc usage it looks like the 11700k is a reasonable step forward from the 10700k worst case they're like similar in terms of performance but there are some reasonable performance uplifts here and there uh, unfortunately a lot of the reasonable performance uplifts still see it coming behind the 5800x but it is a step forward for for Intel, and that's where things come uh, become quite interesting when we start to look at the gaming benchmarks, which we're probably going to get into in a minute. I don't want to jump. Uh, so another thing here is that in the Anantec review, we obviously compared eight core to eight core. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, upcoming results on 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 other CPUs are obviously going to be comparing to the ten core part and the ten core part, uh, the ten nine hundred K, obviously around 18 to 20 percent more performance multi-threaded and that's where we're likely going to see some uh, regressions if you want to compare the seven uh, the 11700k to the 10900k um, anantec has a benchmark feature it's anantec.com slash bench and you can compare any two cpus that we've got tested in the latest suite my assumption was especially based on what tim had sort of seen on the laptop front and especially what intel had been saying that we would see some improvement in gaming performance. And that certainly seemed to be the general consensus, I think, throughout the industry. A lot of people were... Uh, at, at this point, it's best to consider what Intel was testing in those disclosures, um, what resolutions, what settings, what sort of titles. Um, Intel leaned very heavily on the, the CPU-limited um, tests, for example. So ones where you have you know thousands upon thousands of units on screen for example, those sorts of things. Um, so bear in mind when you, know, you see first party numbers, because um, they're always going to be cherry picked, whether they're Intel, AMD or NVIDIA. Um, and you, you know, it's, and some of those numbers may align with the some of the tests that 
as a reviewer you run or as a as a as a reader you see and some of them may not um this whole thing about what is a real world test and what's relevant and what games you should test it's always an ongoing conversation yeah under the or making the assumption that we would see improved gaming performance and that hasn't really been the case uh some games there is well I, i guess it's a bit like the applications but a bit more mixed so we have seen some instances where there is a pretty substantial performance improvement for some games but in a lot of instances there's a regression so i mean the main game we saw an improvement on was gears tactics which is um a very you know has a very good cpu portion because it deals with units on display and uh things like that so i was probably expecting absolute worst case that the performance would be the same agree um, not absolutely not that you would be going backwards and i've mainly focused on looking at their 1080p max data because uh, i sort of find the low resolution stuff while interesting for a for science type test not terribly useful because already like 1080p max with a they're using an rtx 2080 ti it's um debatable as to how useful that information is but well i mean uh don't forget this is a cpu review test of gaming not a gpu review test of gaming so if i'm always in a gpu limited scenario then all we're ever going to do is get the same result and this has been you know throughout my testing of cpus this has always been a key part of the test um we've gone through phases where we do um three games with like four gpus or do we do 12 games with one gpu and uh resolutions should we be testing um should we be testing something in the middle so everybody wants either 1080p or 4040 or 4k tests but then they don't like the fact if you do 4k low or if you do 4k high then that's too high um so i mean our testing generally is it comes in four parts it's 1080p max um the lowest resolution lowest uh, quality um just because there is a small bunch of people who really like those super um cpu heavy gpu light workloads that's for them if you don't like it you can ignore it um then we go for something like a 1440p minimum uh so 1440p resolution minimum quality and then like a 4k or an 8k minimum um at the end as well uh, and that's you know just as as we scale just just the resolution we move into the more sort of gpu limited territory before we even turn on any of the additional um quality features and you know those four sets of 1080p max um 720p or lower minimum 1440p minimum and then 4k plus minimum um that's what i've been doing um for a couple of years now and it's, it's generally worked quite well for a cpu review now if you're looking at it from a gpu re- review perspective um it's not going to be that fun to look at i guess um because we're just testing the same gpu but it is what it is and everybody tests different games at different settings and that's why it's really enjoyable having multiple reviews out in the market when um everybody else's review comes online basically um so you don't like the games i test if you don't like the resolutions i test then do wait because there will be more coming and guys like hardware unboxed uh, they have their own testing and um and they enjoy doing that so let's go see their results when they're done i guess it, and it's good for it doesn't even appear to advantage the intel 11 700k all that much anyway by testing at a lower resolution in a lot of these titles it's no very it very similar anything, to the 1080p yeah. data yep yeah, that's right i did a an average of all the results uh, a geo mean and found that you're looking at 151 fps overall for the 10 700k sort of on average across the games and then it was just a two fps increase for the 11 700k so I think they looked at like what is it about a dozen games yeah so the games being uh deus ex mankind divided a couple of final fantasies world of tanks borderlands 3 f1 2019 far cry 5 they've got gears tactics gda 5 red dead redemption 2 and strange brigade so that most of those games i'd say especially Mm -hmm. if you're testing at 1080p are going to be cpu limited um certainly games like borderlands 3 far cry 5 gears games gta those are games that we've tested. I mean, you don't test all those games right now for CPU workloads, but some of those today... They're are, very... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so at this point, I'll show up uh, one of the results from uh, one of the Gears runs at 1080p because uh, that actually shows how CPU limited versus GPU limited it is. And if I recall correctly, it's about uh, 
two thirds GPU to one third CPU. So, yeah, we're getting on the boundary of where um, C performance still matters quite a lot. So, I find it very concerning for Intel from the perspective that all of the marketing that we've seen so far publicly from Intel has been about gaming on these processes. They haven't really been pushing it as a productivity option. They probably have talked of a little bit about that side of things, uh, probably focusing on, say, your accelerator stuff, the, the general stuff that uh, Intel focuses on. But the primary thing that they want people to buy these parts for is for gaming. They want to keep their lead in gaming or at least switch it from a situation where they're slightly slower than AMD to being slightly faster. So, I mean, uh, looking at the this data, these are none of the games I test. So, I mean, and yeah, Total War Three Kingdoms, that's a high unit test. Uh, Gears, um, Metro, very detailed. Cyberpunk, high unit test. Watch Dogs Legion, very high unit test. Far Cry New Dawn can be a high unit test. And same thing with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, high unit tests. And based on this data, it just does not seem like that is happening or is possible because while they are getting the IPC improvements from the new core design, there has been a regression in latency. And I believe it's one of the earlier tests uh, that you can see on an Antex um, review. Yeah, if you want to see this graph, yeah, go to the Anantec review. Um, it's uh, th this, this is all done by um, Andre, and Andre is really good at this stuff. So view where they have this uh, yeah core to core latency example or cache latency or something along those lines and i think it was l3 i believe yeah l3 something about something about that i've just found it now yeah core estimated structural latency comparison and yeah the 11700k delivers slightly longer latency than the 10700k in most instances and we know gaming is very latency sensitive so we don't have the argument anymore of this being, oh, it's Skylake, but clocked faster again, or something along those lines. Oh, it's Skylake, but it's not six cores, it's eight cores. It's not eight cores, it's 10 cores. This is a new architecture. And they specifically mm -hmm. did this on 14 nanometer to get the frequencies that they needed to deliver the best single thread performance and the best gaming performance. And even when they did that, even when they gave their close to newest architecture, the best process that they had available to them, they still aren't in the region of matching or beating AMD's performance on their with their newest architecture and on their newest node. And I think that is not a great outcome for this generation. Don't forget that the architecture that's inside Rocket, like Cypress Cove, um, was built after Ice Lake was already done. So... In that respect, it's it's already a couple of years old from that perspective. Not great at all, really. No, it's not. But <laughs> I mean, what can they do? <laughs> they, were all, they were always making the best of a bad situation. I think Ian even said that in his uh, review. Yep. So, yeah, the, the, I'm sure the engineers were thrilled about having to backport these designs that they had <laughs> you know, ready to work on 10 nanometer. So that's really what it is. It's the best of a bad situation. Uh, and unfortunately, even though our expectations weren't particularly high for it, it hasn't really met those expectations. But it certainly would have allowed Intel to have the marketing of the fastest gaming processor, which we know is very important to them. Whereas with this review, they can't even say that. Well, I mean, uh, in this review, I've only got the 5800X. It's not even the 5950X if you want to go for fastest gaming CPU in the market. So um, there's also that to consider. So that's, Yeah, that's right. And with this review, Anantec has only looked at the eight core parts, which has made the graphs all nice and easy to, to make comparisons with. Um, all the data for all the other processors is in Anantec's benchmark database. That's anantec.com slash bench. So if you want to go straight to an individual test, you'll see all the CPUs and all the results we get in that test. Or if you want to go compare two processors, like the 16 core with the eight core, then that's what it's there for. And all the data is there. So. But as I was saying in a moment ago, this really is an 11900K review as well. Close to At it. At best, yeah. we're, we're going to see maybe a 4 or 5% improvement in certain areas. And that review, though, would surely include the 10900K. Yeah. So I think that is going to be 
a bit of a brutal review uh, for Intel. Again, not knowing pricing, but comparing the eight core part to the 10 core part and not the equivalent. Because if you're looking, if you have a look here and you're looking at the 11700K versus the 10700K in productivity, it's like the performance uplift isn't that huge. Yeah, I so think they while, said, and Antec said here, for example, in floating points, it was like 19% faster, but then in, in right. uh, integer workloads, it was like multi-thread 7% faster, single thread 13% faster. And that's what we're seeing, like the 7%. So uh, those results were taken with uh, spec 2017 standard in industry um, benchmark for you know IPC and performance gains. So uh, we've used that for a while and results we got. Seven to thirteen percent is what we're seeing in a lot of these productivity benchmarks. Yep, and that's that's not going to cut it for the eleven nine hundred K versus the ten nine hundred K. That there's much here to get excited about, like the ten seven hundred K. If you're focusing on the gaming market and that was sort of your thing that you were trying to capture, then a ten seven hundred K, ten nine hundred K would have done the job. Similar sort of mm -hmm. thing to this. So, it, especially if this is costing them more to manufacture than those parts were. It's kind of like mm -hmm. you make a part that's only slightly better if that, and then it costs you more to make. So you're kind of just losing money overall. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a weird situation, especially if they have to price it lower to compete. It's that's a, that's a very good point. Um, you know, if, if, if Intel has to come in with pricing that's lower and it's more expensive to make and overall performance um, is on the same level, then aside from you know the additional features like PCIe 4 or USB 3.2 gen uh, 2x2 then yeah everybody's going to migrate back to the 10th gen parts uh, so that's actually a good point and uh, well I mean there's talk about Old Lake coming um, though I have opinions on that as well it's, it's a real crunch on yeah. them with this particular product I guess it depends on how much having like a, a 11th gen part helps boost sales it's true and, and create hype for a new generation so that could be part of it as well yeah exactly so i think we've been going for about an hour now on this review which is probably longer than it takes to actually read the review from start to finish so <laughs> <laughs> we did a poor job of summarizing it uh but yeah there, there really are thoughts so probably disappointing overall based on this sort of early review yeah uh but yeah more to come yeah, and I think I think one of the lines mentioned here in the end of uh, an Antex review here, uh, but the clear answer during this chip crunch is to buy the processor you can find at a reasonable price. And it kind of that kind of is a situation in the market just overall right now across GPUs, CPUs, everything, is that yeah. it could come when everyone can talk about these products on March 30th that Ryzen processors are still hard to find, which kind of makes a lot of the performance stuff irrelevant to some degree, like we're seeing on the GPU side, which just if you have a certain amount of money, just try and buy whatever you can get. Um, yep. But yeah, for the future, it's probably why Intel is looking to replace this lineup with Alder Lake as early as this year. So mm -hmm. a six month, this product may only be on the market for six months, who knows. Hopefully you've enjoyed our analysis a little bit of what, it's kind of something we haven't really done before is looking at someone else's review and, and talked about mm. in this way, but these sort of reviews don't come around too often, I wouldn't have thought. So, I mean, that was interesting. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen somebody do a review of one of my reviews before. Um, it's great to see, great to see that, great to see the guys, um, you know, both uh, going into some of the numbers from their perspective. Um, also, you know, a good fair use of the content. That's always good to see. Um, you know, positive with uh, how we've tested and we're obviously looking forward to see how the, these guys test uh, with the numbers. Uh, some takeaways here is obviously, you know, trying to find out exactly where some of these bottlenecks are um, that we've tested for. And uh, there's lots of things still to test. Um, higher memory, um, seeing what any of the upcoming BAS updates do, if there are any to come before launch. Um, whether that does performance uh, improvements or performance regressions based on uh, safety and security, that's always a concern. And then going into details about what we can do with uh, AVX 512 and how that relates to power consumption. Um, that's going to be a big topic uh, for Intel's true dream of implementing AI um, across the board for more casual workloads than just 
um, just these sort of higher niche uh, scientific HPC type applications. So thanks again to the Hardware Unboxed guys for their review of my review. This has been my review of their review of my review. Um, thumbs up if you liked it. Thumbs down if you didn't. Uh, leave a comment in below. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Smash that bell. And, you know, Patreon, all that other stuff. Thanks to the patrons. They really um, do help make this channel uh, grow. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll get some more content through this week. And uh, maybe some more um, Rocket Lake stuff before the end of the month.